How did Samsung, a company founded in the midst of World War II and the Korean War, manage to remain a successful company today? Imagine starting a company when the country is in turmoil, yet that company can still lead the industry in modern times. I'm sure many of you think it's because of their leadership in the smartphone industry, but they don't just lead in mobile phones, in fact. I don't think the smartphone sector even matters much to Samsung in South Korea. Think about it. The country's construction sector is yours. The healthcare sector is yours. You're making jets and tanks for the military, and the company ensuring the people's lives is also yours. Would you care if the phone in their pocket is yours too? Yes, Samsung leads in all these sectors in South Korea. Some articles have even written that the president of Samsung is more powerful than the president of South Korea. This is the story of Lee Byung-chul, who rose from nothing to reach this level. In the first half of the 20th century, the situation in Korea was not good. The Japanese were exploiting the country and trying to erase the Korean nation. Amid these difficult times, in February 1910, Lee Byung-chul, the fourth child of Lee Chan-woo, a wealthy landowner from the upper-class noble Yang Ban family, and his wife, Kwon Jae Lim, was born. Lee's family lived in Uiryong, a city in Gyeongsangnam-do province. Lee's father was one of the submissive noble family under Japanese control, and to avoid losing his wealth, he had to comply with them. Lee began his studies at Jungdong High School in Seoul, and in 1929, he was admitted to the political economy department of Waseda University in Tokyo. However, in 1931, he left university and returned to his family in Uiryong. Lee took care of the family's properties and assets. In 1938, one evening, Lee was deep in thought and decided he needed to start a business. In that same year, at the age of just 28, Lee founded a grocery store called Samsung in the city of Daegu. The name Samsung means three stars in Korean and carries meanings of being big, strong, and eternal. At first, Lee sold noodles and fish products at the Samsung grocery store and occasionally exported noodles to China. However, during this period, Korea was under Japanese surveillance and thanks to his father's connections, he found the opportunity to export, but it was not an easy process for Lee. During World War II, Lee managed to profit by selling basic food and care products. In 1947, he moved Samsung's headquarters to Seoul. But in 1950, with the outbreak of the Korean War, he was forced to relocate the headquarters from Seoul as the war significantly disrupted his business. After the war ended in 1953, South Korea became dependent on foreign countries. And seeing this situation, Lee decided to diversify Samsung and produce affordable products for the people. In 1954, he established Chail Jedong, a sugar refinery plant in Seoul, and later in Busan. He founded Samsung Mulsan, South Korea's largest wool factory. With the profits from these factories, Lee began to establish other businesses, bought stores, and also laid the foundations of the insurance business. In the 1960s, the South Korean government began supporting family-owned businesses known as Chaebol, to help develop the country. The term Chaebol refers to large family-owned companies in Korean, encompassing businesses like Samsung, LG, and Hyundai. The government provided these companies with credit and tax benefits and supported export-oriented production. However, this led to difficulties for smaller businesses in the country. Samsung used the government loans to invest in banking, oil refining, insurance, and other fields. Lee believed that diversification was the key to Samsung's growth, and he aggressively pursued this strategy. Part of this strategy was Samsung Electronics. Founded in 1968, Samsung Electronics began collaborating with Sanyo, and in 1970, it produced its first 12-inch black and white TV. In the following years, it manufactured color TVs, refrigerators, and air conditioners. In 1974, Samsung Semiconductor was established to produce microchips for Samsung Electronics. And in the same year, Samsung Heavy Industries was also founded, focusing on ship production and began operations on Gaoja Island. Another company was established in the 1970s, Samsung Construction, which began operations in the construction industry. In 1983, Samsung Electronics entered the personal computer sector and produced its first computer. With the opening of this market, Samsung Semiconductor invested more in microchip production, and in the coming years, 
it expanded to meet the world's demand for microchips. Samsung initially entered the telecommunications sector by producing telephone switchboards, and in 1980, it planned to enter the mobile phone industry. The first step was the production of switchboards, followed by the manufacturing of mobile phones and fax systems. In 1987, Samsung's founder and chairman, Lee Byung-chul, passed away, and his third son, Lee Kun-hee, took over the leadership of Samsung. During the period of Lee Byung-chul, the South Korean government granted privileges to Samsung. Large companies like Samsung, as well as others such as LG and Hyundai, were supported in every area. However, there were some problems. The government claimed that South Korea, which had just emerged from the Korean War, needed chables, large family-run conglomerates. It raised suspicions when, a few years after receiving state-backed credit, some of the banks that provided the loans were acquired by Samsung. However, the government turned a blind eye to this, which negatively impacted small businesses. In other words, in the 1960s, no newly established small business in South Korea had much chance of success. Furthermore, foreign companies were also blocked from operating in the country. For instance, in the 1970s, it was announced that Japanese companies could not sell electronic goods in South Korea, which directed consumers towards Samsung. Park Chung-hee, who was the president at that time, was running a policy of centralization. It was even said that foreign companies would only be allowed to sell their products in South Korea if they shared some of their secrets with Samsung. The country had become dependent on a single company, and if things didn't go well for Samsung, the entire population of South Korea would be affected. Additionally, because of the Korean War, the United States was providing financial aid to South Korea, and part of this money was being funneled into Samsung. To be fair, the government's policy was correct in some ways. As Samsung grew, it hired more people, strengthened the economy, and, most importantly, brought in dollars through exports. However, this positive development did not prevent Lee Byung-chul from being seen as a symbol of corruption in South Korea. After Lee Byung-chul passed away, his son, Lee Kun-hee, took over. Nine years after assuming control, he was accused of bribing the then-president. President Kim Young-sam pardoned Lee Kun-hee, allowing him to continue serving as the chairman of Samsung. In 2008, Lee Kun-hee faced another lawsuit, this time accused of tax evasion and bribing prosecutors. In 2010, Lee Myung-bak pardoned him. In other words, Lee was accused twice, yet faced no punishment and returned to his position as chairman of Samsung. These controversial incidents illustrate how deeply intertwined Samsung is with the government. Moreover, the media often refuses to report negatively about Samsung. For example, after one of Samsung's former lawyers left the company, he wrote a book called Think Samsung, in which he made various accusations against Lee Kun-hee. The South Korean press did not publish any news about this book. Today, Samsung is managed by Lee Kun-hee's son, Lee Jae-yong, and remains as large and powerful as ever. They are present in nearly every field in South Korea. The most important company within this conglomerate, known as Samsung Group, is Samsung Electronics, which produces products like mobile phones, laptops, televisions, screens, tablets, and similar items. Samsung Electronics was founded in 1968, and its first product was black and white televisions, produced in collaboration with Sanyo. Next comes Samsung C and T Corporation, which participates in construction projects and was one of the companies involved in building the Burj Khalifa. In addition, Samsung Heavy Industries works on all types of shipbuilding projects, including the construction of tankers and cargo ships. Another company is Samsung Insurance, which handles all kinds of insurance services. A large portion of the South Korean population holds life insurance through this company. Then, there is Samsung Medical Center, which owns some of the best hospitals serving South Korea. Another is Samsung Everland, a park located in the city of Yongin, which is the largest and most beautiful park in South Korea. This company also operates some hotels, 
Samsung Card is a company in South Korea that provides credit card and banking services. One of the significant companies is Samsung SDS, which produces lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles and has partnerships with BMW. These are Samsung's most important companies, but they are not all. There are also companies affiliated with Samsung that operate in advertising, pharmaceutical production, marketing services, and apparel. Now, it becomes clear why Samsung is untouchable in South Korea. Globally, Samsung has also been in the spotlight for certain incidents. One of these was the Note 7 explosion incidents, during which Samsung faced a crisis but failed to manage it properly. When the first Note 7 exploded, they did not intervene quickly, and by the time they tried, it was too late. When Samsung attempted to take action, Note 7 were banned from airlines, and at the entrances to shopping malls, security confiscated them. Despite this, Samsung remains a brand that many consumers prefer across various fields. The quality of their products is sufficient. If it weren't, they would only be serving South Korea. Samsung is considered by some to be more pioneering than Apple in the smartphone market, with a more innovative perspective. Some users claim that features introduced in iPhones by Apple had already been implemented by Samsung, and I believe there is some truth to this. However, Samsung is not just leading in the smartphone market, but also in many other technological products. The company's early involvement in the production of electric car batteries and its work on artificial intelligence which they have integrated into their phones in a timely manner, answers the question of why Samsung is so big. If Samsung were not such a large company, South Korea would not be a wealthy country. This is because South Korea is smaller than some US states and has very few natural resources. Thanks to Samsung, South Korea is now a prosperous country. When asked whether the government's Chibol protection policy of the 1960s was the right decision, the answer can be yes. When comparing where Samsung started in its business journey to where it is now, it is undeniably a surprising and impressive success story. Certain circumstances may have given Samsung an advantage over its competitors, but still, Lee Byung-chul's determination and his achievement of growing this company in the midst of war is an admirable story, in my opinion. Thank you for watching. If you want to support, feel free to subscribe. If you'd like to support financially, you can check out my Patreon. You can also check out my video about Tesla here. You're appreciated. Take care.